The following program is sponsored by the goodwill, prayers, and financial resources of the Heritage Partners. Miracles radicalize us. Miracles make us to be focused on God. To be a Christian is to be called to be a miracle worker. Think of the sufferings of Christ and be thankful. And he did all that just for you and me not to burn in hell. This morning we are preaching on the subject we've entitled Carrying His Presence. Carrying His Presence or Hosting His Presence. And I want to read from First Chronicles. If you have been coming to this congregation for the past four months, this has been a place of our uh, lodging. We've been preaching from uh, these texts. First Chronicles chapter number 15 verse number 11. The Bible says they endeavored Summon the priests, Zadok and Abiata, and the Levites, Uriah, Asiah, Joel, Shamia, Eliel, and uh, Aminadab. And he said to them, you are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. To the place that I have prepared for it. Because you did not carry it the first time. The Lord our God broke out against us. Because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord. The God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders. With the poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we are so thankful for the reading of your word. May you minister to us. May you give us direction. May you show us wisdom. May you show us light. And may you make us, our oh Father, apply this word to our lives, to our souls. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Now, Father, ask, may the meditations of my heart the words of my mouth be acceptable before you, my rock and my redeemer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Today we bring, actually we jump, if you did know, we jumped two services. I want us to pick up and try to, to bring towards a close a series we started uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, apart from the the sermons that we preached on uh, Easter and last Sunday, uh, we go back to a series that we were calling The Spirit and Leadership. The Spirit and Leadership. The Spirit and Leadership. And in this series, so far, by the grace of God, he gave us ability to minister and bring four other sermons. The first sermon was seeking his presence for our city. Seeking his presence for our city. And in this sermon, we looked at what David desired that the Ark of the Covenant should not be only for a family. That the Ark of the Covenant should be accessed by the whole city. The praises of God should not only be accessed by one person, by one family. It should be accessed by the whole country, by the whole community. And therefore we brought this message, we said, seeking his praises for our city. The second sermon was called following his presence. And in this message, we discussed our need to develop the ability to follow the praises of God. The ability to follow the praises of God, to hear, to understand, following his presence. We said each and every one of us has the responsibility to train ourselves to hear, to see, to follow the presence of the Lord. The third sermon was called the power of sacrifice. The power of sacrifice. And in this message, we explored the place and the power of sacrifice in the Christian work. Even though we recognize that Jesus Christ was sacrificed once and for all, 
We do not offer blood sacrifices, but God regards us that we should always sacrifice ourselves and our bodies as living sacrifices to him. The Christian walk is a walk of sacrifice. Then the fourth sermon, we talked about organizing for his presence. That we must be deliberate to organize, to set the atmosphere for God to come and appear. For God to manifest himself. In this sermon today, number five, carrying his presence or in brackets, hosting his presence. In this message, our emphasis is to know our roles and our responsibilities as carriers of his praises. Our roles and our responsibility as carriers of his praises. What we must do to qualify ourselves or to have ourselves qualified by God. Qualified that we may be carriers of God's presence. What should we do? And in this message this morning, we have read a text in which David, for the second time now, is attempting to take the Ark of the Covenant from where they had left it temporarily in the house of Obed Edom. They had taken it out six miles from a place called Kiriath Jerim, and an accident happened. They never followed the rules, they never followed the law. And Uzzah, who wanted to reach out to touch as the ox was staggering was slain, was killed. So David left this uh, Ark of the Covenant, which is a symbol of the praises of God, in the house of a man called Obed Edom. And the Bible says in three months, Obed Edom's home was miraculously blessed. They came to David and they told him, and they said, Obed Edom's house has been so blessed. Now, I've always wondered with that phrase, I do not know how they, you know, measured the blessing on Obed Edom in three months. It's very difficult to measure the prosperity and the blessing of a family in three months. I do not know what they saw. I don't know, maybe they saw the glory of God on Obed Edom's house, uh, face. I do not know, maybe they saw that uh, there was peace on Obed Edom's home. I do not know, maybe prosperity, shalom happened. I do not know. But they came to a conclusion. Obed Edom's home was blessed within three months. And David said, uh-uh, we need to check this so that the blessing should not only be for Obed Edom, it should be for the whole city. It should be for the whole country. So they make the second attempt to go and get the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. So this is the context in which we have read this morning. Where David says, now you will priest. And David at this stage was being supported by two high priests. And the two high priests you see in there is Zadok and Abiata. Now just a, a little uh, and a side, side, side trail I would want you to remember. At one time, God through Samuel had made a declaration and a limitation on the family of Eli. You remember? The family of Eli. Eli had two sons, priests, who were very, very bad priests. Very immoral. And when Samuel was being raised, he gave a prophetic utterance and he said there will be a time in the future where the lineage of Eli will be cut off. The lineage of Eli will be cut off. Eli was a high priest and the role of a high priest was followed through the family. Abiata is from the family of Eli and soon in this generation, Abiata will be the last person. So there is another lineage that is being picked up, and that is the lineage of Zadok. So you will see that David is ministered to by two high priests. I wanted you just to understand that. Why Zadok and Abiata side by side? Abiata's lineage will soon be closed based on the prophetic word that Samuel had stated because the children of Eli were evil, were immoral. Now, he tells Zadok, he tells Abiata, and he says, you priests, you Levites, 
you did not do the right thing. You never told us how to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Now, we want you to sanctify yourself. We want you to set yourself ready so that we can bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. That is the context that we have. Now, right from the very beginning, our recurrent thought really, what we want to emphasize in here is that carrying his presence is for all Christians. And all it takes is to be ready and be determined to follow him. Carrying his presence is for all Christians. And it is your determination that is asked of you. It is your ability to follow, your ability to focus on him that is necessary in carrying his presence. So to experience the manifestation of his presence, first and foremost, is a dance between humanity and divinity. To experience the manifestation of his presence is a dance between humanity and divinity. It is a collaboration between God and human beings. Every time we see and experience the manifestation of his presence, we should always remember there are two things that are in play. Number one, the role of human beings. And number two, the role of God. And essentially, it is human beings that set the stage ready for God's manifestation. So for every manifestation that we see, it is that dance, that combination, that collaboration. <laughs> they will say a collabo, not so. People from the entertainment world, a collabo. It's a collabo between God and humanity. It's a collabo. It's a collaboration between humanity and divinity. So the manifestation of his presence is what we also call a revival. It's what we call a spiritual awakening. When we uh, talk about God manifesting his presence, it's what we call a revival. And I want to submit to you, friends, that the revival is indeed a collaboration of you as a person and God manifesting himself. There will be no revival if the man, the woman, does not set the stage. During the dedication of the temple, the first temple, after the tabernacle was closed, the Ark of the Covenant was transferred in the temple by Solomon. Another, another ritual, another event that was done almost like the father had done previously. 40 years earlier. Uh, we see the manifestation of God. And God appears, and as he appears to Solomon, he tells him this formula of this collab I'm talking about. From 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, verse number 14, which should be a memory verse for every one of us. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my first and turn away from their wicked ways, that is human activity. If my people who are called by my name, number one, shall humble themselves. Number two, shall pray. Number three, shall seek my first. Number four, shall turn from their wicked words. That is human beings setting the stage. That's human beings setting the stage. Now you see God's side. He says, then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. That is God's sight. So the manifestation of his praises is always a collaboration between two. Humanity and God himself. It's a dance between God and human beings. It's a, a constant interrelationship, interaction between men, women and God himself. So revival, as we've said, is a collaboration. If ever we are seeking for revival, we need to remember God is always waiting for us. He's waiting for us to set the stage. He's waiting for us to prepare. He's waiting for us to be ready. He's waiting for us to be in the place. So we can't talk about revival without us being ready. 
So sometimes, you know, we, we have these, we go on memory lanes. And we say, oh, there used to be a revival in this country. We are always talking about the old, the past. But the question is, are you getting ready? Are you setting the stage ready? Is the table being prepared? Is the sacrifice being laid on the altar? That's what God is waiting for. For his people who are called by his name. That they humble themselves. They pray. They seek his first. They turn away from their wicked words. That's when God appears. So when we talk about revival, we are talking about that combination. So every seeker of God must understand the awesome responsibility of doing what is necessary for God to manifest his presence. Every seeker of God, everyone who is intensely seeking for God, everyone who is intensely seeking for the manifestation of God, everyone who is intensely seeking that God appears in their family, appears in their marriage, appears in their workplace, they must know the awesome responsibility of doing what is necessary for God to manifest his presence. In today's message, I have used for a title the word caring or hosting. This, this, this word caring his presence is both ridiculous and blasphemous at the same time. <laughs> both ridiculous and blasphemous. Ridiculous because really we can't carry his presence. <laughs> God feels everything. He's found everything. Everywhere. Are we together? God is omnipresent. Is present everywhere. In his essence is found everywhere. He is on planet Pluto. He's on the other galaxy. He is here. He's in Russia. He knows what is happening under the sea. He is found everywhere. He doesn't just know from far. He is there. Can you put that in your uh, cranial box? He does not just know things from afar. He doesn't just know because he knows he's from afar. Uh -uh. His presence is everywhere. So really talking about carrying that type of a being is ridiculous. It's also actually blasphemous. How can men think they can carry his presence? But permit me to use them because uh, <laughs> I'm using a, an image from the Old Testament where the Ark of the Covenant is, is carried on the shoulder. Now, there is a, a person whom I borrow that word hosting from. And he uses uh, the phrase from... Um, uh, first, rather, John chapter number 1, verse 32 and 33. When Jesus Christ was baptized in water, and the Bible says when he came out of water, the, the Holy Spirit alighted on him in the form of a dove. And the phrase that is used there in the form of a dove says, and remained on him. It's very strange, eh? how, how John puts it. You, you can... You can, you can read there. John chapter number 1, verse 32 and verse 33. The dove came and stayed on him and they remained there. <laughs> now, John never told us later on that, oh, the bird, the bird now flew away. <laughs> he left the statement they say, and remained there. For how long did that dove remain on Jesus? Of course, you know, not everyone knew throughout Jerusalem of what had happened on the River Jordan. But imagine Jesus Christ walking, even if it's for a few steps, with a bird here. Even if it's just, uh, you know, for five minutes before it flew away. Just imagine with me that he, he walked with the dove here. And that's the essence of hosting the presence. The essence of hosting the presence is that everything that we do, we should do it being mindful that the dove is on our shoulder. That's hosting. Every step we make, every activity we do, we do it being mindful. The dove is here. And the dove is very, you know, very tender. and uh, They fly away quickly. That's hosting. 
hosting. But I also use the word carry because of First Chronicles chapter 13, chapter 15, chapter 16. The symbol of the praises of God, which is the Ark of the Covenant, was carried on the shoulders. But I want to use another text. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. If you can read Second Corinthians. I'll read verse number, chapter number 4, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. It says, for what we proclaim, verse number 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, number 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now verse number 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. He says we have this treasure. The treasure is the power of the Lord himself, the Holy Spirit. He says we are jars of clay and we have this treasure. So wherever you go, you carry this treasure. So permit me, for lack of better words, to use the word carrying. Permit me to use these words that are inadequate to describe that which, humanly speaking, we are responsible to do. Permit me to use this word carrying or hosting for today. And our desire is to talk about carrying his presence in this jars of clay. Jars, earthen jars of clay. How do we carry this treasure? How do we carry his presence? How do we carry his presence? I have six elements that pertain to carrying his presence out of this text. For this uh, service, I'm going to deal with three. And for the next service, I'll add the other three. So if you want to get a full message, you're welcome to the second service. Number one, element number one. The weight of his praises, or the weight of his praises, is carried by priests. The weight of his praises is carried by priests. David confronts Zadok and Abiata. He says, uh-uh. The responsibility of carrying the Ark of the Covenant is yours. Actually, there is a ritual. There is a, there is a policy how he is carried. He is not carried by everyone. He is carried in a particular world. And that's your responsibility. So I would want to clearly uh, affirm what David said. That we should accept the order of carrying the Ark of the Covenant. It is to be carried by priests. Now, that's not where we should put the full stop. Because there has been a historical confusion based on what I have just stated. In affirming and confirming what David stated. And the historical confusion is that... Uh, People have then decided, I as a lay person can't access the presence of the Lord. If it is supposed to be carried by the priest, so we'll wait until Papa comes along. If the praises is supposed to be carried by priests and Levites, I am not Pastor Luisha. He is the pastor. Therefore, I'm just going to be watching and waiting until he, he throws something on me. I'll just wait. But that's a historical confusion that has never uh, decided to walk with the progressive revelation of what God did in Christ Jesus. Because in Christ Jesus... There was a huge change in how the orders 
of priests and prophets are done. When God set the New Testament church, the whole New Testament church is a community of priests. The whole New Testament church is a community of prophets. We are a prophetic community. And we are a community of priests. And God had deliberately put also a type in the children of Israel right when Israel was receiving a covenant, the Sinaitic covenant. God already had said, you are going to be a kingdom of priests or a royal priesthood. So every one of us, we carry the same responsibilities as priests. If you look into 2 Peter, rather 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood or a kingdom of priests. The whole kingdom is a kingdom of priests. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, you are a priest before God. You do not need to wait for Papa Luesha. Tell them. Aha. Uh -huh. You are a priest of God. Some of us, we want to wait for those, you know, super duper saints. Those who are very holy. I don't know how they look like. Because I'm not part of that community. But we wait for those great duper saints for them to release the anointing to us. But I stand here to declare every one of us, we have an access into the praises of God. We are, as priests, we can access the praises of God wherever we are. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's what we are. Revelation chapter number 1. Let me read this for you also. Revelation chapter number 1 verse 5 says, And from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Verse 6. And made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we are priests. So when David says, you priests, you are supposed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. In the New Testament, he says, every one of us, we are supposed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Every one of us, women, men, youths, young people, if you are born again, you are supposed to carry the Ark of the Covenant, the praises of the Lord. You can access the praises of the Lord wherever you are. So in Christ, all of us, we have the responsibility to carry, to host, to steward his presence. Every one of us. So do you want to enjoy his presence? Be born again and you will enjoy his praises. Too many of us we want his praises without his association. Too many of us want his miracles without a relationship. How do you become part of that priestly community? Is to be born again. That's how you become part of that priestly community. Be born again. So as a priest of God every Christian can and must carry his presence. Element number two. His praises is better hosted by those who purify themselves. His praises is better hosted by those who purify themselves. So before carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the priests needed to purify themselves. Now David demands for a physical purification. And if you read in the book of Leviticus, you will see how priests were supposed to purify themselves. How they were supposed to clean themselves. How they were supposed to clean their attire. How they were supposed to have an anointing oil placed upon them. They were supposed to cleanse themselves. And particularly, they were supposed also to shun some specific activities. Some specific places. There was a process of cleansing. But I want you to notice that if we are all priests and yet we do not follow, you know, the Levitical order of animal sacrifice, then there must be another way of purifying ourselves. Then the purification that God demands of us is a purification of us bringing ourselves as living sacrifices before God. 
That's a purification he demands of us. That we live in holiness. We live always mindful of the Holy Spirit in us. That we do not grieve him. That we do not anger him. That we do not try to cheat him. The Holy Spirit is constantly working with us. So being in Christ is the first act of separation. Being in Christ is the first act of separation. And this qualifies us to be priests. Being in Christ qualifies us to be priests that we can serve before God. So priests serve before God. And you as a priest, you are supposed to serve before the Lord. Priests serve before the Lord and minister to the people. You as a priest, you are supposed to serve before the Lord and minister to the community to which you belong. So every believer must consciously and deliberately cleanse themselves as they carry the presence of God. We must be people of purity. And part of what you will see in the process of revival is turning away from sin. As you seek that heaven sent spiritual awakening, God demands for you to prepare yourself, purify yourself, cleanse yourself, turn away from wicked words. Those activities that we do that makes us feel guilty in the presence of the Lord. He says, repent of them, turn away from them. So when David demands of the priest, purify yourselves, he is actually asking for a deliberate action of repentance, deliberate action of cleansing themselves. Friends, I am hungry for the presence of God. And that demands consistent repentance, consistent confession before the Lord. We need to remember we can't just have an image of being Christian. We must behave as Christians. The Malawian country is that example. We changed our names. We became Christian, 82% Christians. We got baptized. At one time, we were called Mr. Chimutu. Now we are called Antonio. We changed the names. We have all the imagery of being Christian. We go to church, but we do not behave one. It is important for us, if we are going to have a heaven sent to revival, we must remember God, God wants people that have repented. God wants people that are purifying themselves. It's not an old-fashioned message to demand for repentance. It's not an old-fashioned message to demand for confession from sin. Asking God to cleanse us. Asking to repent before God and asking for a revival. That's what it demands. It's a dance between man and divinity. Humanity and divinity. Do I want a heaven-sent spiritual awakening? I must be ready. Do I want a change in my life? I must be ready. Unless I do not want a change, then there's no need for me to be ready. But when do you stop this act of purification? No, you don't. It's a lifetime occupation. Why? You daily purify yourself. You daily deny yourself. You daily repent before God. Why? Because you are a priest. You permanently serve before the Lord. Pastor Sarah last week talked about this young man, Samuel, who was dedicated to the Lord and was to remain before the Lord forever. That's a phrase that was used. He was to remain before the Lord forever. But in essence, what it means, he's supposed to, re to remain before the Lord permanently. 
He's supposed to be saving the Lord permanently. You and I, as priests of God, we serve him permanently. We don't serve him only when we come to church. We serve him when we are at Capitol Hill. We do not only serve him when we have gone on a, a mission field. We serve him when we are at Malangaranga and doing all those cells. We serve him when we are at Bunda, at Magu. We are as students. We are as teachers. We serve him wherever God has sent us. In every field, in every world where we we serve him permanently. We are priests. We are priests and we serve him permanently. Number three, and the last one for this service. Carrying his praises is an activity of leadership. Carrying his praises is an activity of leadership. And I come from the school of thought that every one of us, we have ability to lead. Every one of us, we are responsible to lead. Every one of us, we must be cautious that we are leading. Whatsoever we are doing, we are teaching somebody, we are leading somebody. I always make a joke. If you are driving and you beat, uh, you know, rather, you cross the road when the street light is telling you that you are not supposed to cross and there is a child in the car your son is in the car you have just taught your son even if they are 11 years old 12 years old you have taught them that if you are stressed you can forgo the law that is set that's what you have taught them so we always teach we always teach and we always lead Sometimes we lead from our behavior. Sometimes we lead from our mouth. But we are always leading. We are always teaching somebody. So when it comes to the carrying of the praises of the Lord, it's an activity of leadership. When you look into this text, David is a king and he confronts the Levites, he confronts the priests. It is a community of leaders. And this is what he says. You and I... We are responsible for this. We are responsible to ensure that there is a praises of God in our community. That's what he is saying. You Levites, a priest, and us, the civil leaders, the people that stay in the palace, we are responsible to ensure that there is a praises of God over our city, over our country. Seeking the praises of the Lord is an activity of leadership. If we, you, you are going to seek the praises of the Lord over your company, over your organization, over Capitol Hill, there must be a demand that leaders rise up to the fore, come up to say, yes, we are going to lead, we are going to direct. Because seeking the praises for a community is a leadership activity. At the end of this service, we are going to pray and we are going to declare some things. We are going to read a declaration I have uh, framed. and uh, I want you to understand that we count ourselves as a privileged church. A church that is a perceptor. A church that has been framed, started with a specific motive. That we are a missions uh, 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 center. That we are a missionary church. That we are supposed to be the sort of this earth, the light of the world. That we are supposed to be planting churches. And we do not regard that responsibility, you know, uh, casually. It is a, a very important responsibility. And if we are going to do that, and we know that we've been placed in this city for a purpose, then we must act as leaders in this city. We must develop ourselves to a place where we steward the praises of the Lord over this city. So community leaders are responsible for the vision and direction of the community. So that's why David confronts them. He says, you never stood up. You never gave us direction. You priests, you never rose up. You never did your responsibility. And I want to speak to every one of us. There are times when we are supposed to speak out and we don't speak out. There are times when we are supposed to step out and we do not step out. He says, you are responsible. You priests. You Levites, you are responsible for what we went through. You never gave us vision. You never gave us direction. So leaders must have the vision and desire to see God manifest in their community. Now, I'll be honest with you. Whenever leaders do not take up their responsibilities, some people have challenges. Whenever leaders do not take their role to lead, some people die. 
Whenever people, whenever leaders fail to lead, there are always consequences in the community. <laughs> I've put it there that oozers die when leaders don't take up responsibility. You as a father, when you don't take up the responsibility, your family, your marriage goes into trouble. You as a mother, when you don't take up responsibility, your marriage, your family goes way wide. It is a responsibility. Leadership is a, a responsibility. So David says, you never took your responsibility. You never took your responsibility seriously. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the reality of life is that it is others that suffer most other than leaders. That's a reality of life. The president makes a bad decision. It's a community, it's a nation that suffers. He's living in the state house. David makes a mistake. He counts people. He tells Joab, go count the armies. He is secure. 70,000 people die. Unfortunately, that's a reality of life. We do make mistakes and many people suffer because of the decisions we've made. And leaders, we need to understand that's a huge burden to carry. That's a huge responsibility to carry. Wherever you are, in the home, in marriage, at the workplace, in academia, in the political square, public square, we need to remember that the decision we make comes with consequences. But responsible leaders always desire to capture the pain for their mistakes and sins. You may not, re, you may not bring the people back to life, but you have to carry the responsibility of sharing their pain. That's a responsibility of leaders. So David comes to the Lord and says, Father, this is not right. Then he asks the questions, how will the praises of the Lord come back to me? How will the ark of the covenant come back to me? He shared the responsibility. He shared, he shared the pain of the people. We need to remember that. Responsible leaders work towards remedying and correcting their mistakes always. Are you a leader? Turn to your neighbor and ask them, are you a leader? Everyone of you, you should answer in the affirmative, I truly, I am. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, truly, I am. Ask them, are you a priest? Answer, truly, I am. You stand in the presence of the Lord every time, permanently, serving before him. And whatsoever decision you make will have consequences. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Quickly, would you just lift up your hands and start worshiping. Start telling God that you appreciate the responsibility that you have that you appreciate the role that is given you as a priest, that you stand in the gap to pray for people, to identify yourself with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Just lift up your hands and start worshiping. Start worshiping him in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for the responsibility you give us as priests. Thank you, God, for the responsibility that you give us as daughters and sons who belong, oh God, to a royal priesthood in the name of Jesus Christ. We honor you. We bless you. Thank you, Lord God, for your manifestation. Thank you for your glory. And thank you for your demand that we can carry the ark of the covenant, the uh, uh, you know the praises of God of, of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our hearts, in the name of Jesus Christ. We honor you, Lord Father. We bless you. Thank you, Lord God, for your visitation. Thank you for your glory. Thank you, Lord God, for your touch. Thank you for your love in the name of Jesus Christ. Now I want to ask you to lift up your hands as we confess together this prayer. Lift up your hands as we dedicate ourselves to the Lord. Would you pray and say, Lord, I dedicate myself as a priest before you. I pray 
that I become conscious that I'm supposed to be a servant in your presence. Lord, help me to be focused. Give me grace to remember my role and my responsibilities. Train me in understanding the culture of hosting your praises, of carrying your praises, of stewarding your praises. Help me, O oh Father, to be conscious of developing that culture. That every day in your praises, as a priest, I save you. In Jesus' name. Now go ahead and pray in the name of the Lord. Rajekata kata kara jendere ba katera ba jekata rebo shekatere jekatere ba nama mama zetere berebe jetere mbe kete kese keta lekato jekatere borobo jekate rekate ba jekatere berebo jekatere berebe borobo ko jekatere berebo lakatere bo ka jekatere mamba lekatere berebo borobo ko jekatere berebe berebe lakatere borobo ko jekatere lakatere borobo jekatere mamba La mama mama ba je te rebe le ke te rebe rebe rebo ka te reba le ka te rebo robo je ka te ka le ka te mama ba ba ka te reba le ka te rebo robo ko je ka te rebe le ka te rebo robo ka je ka ta na mama 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 de ke rebe le ke te reba je ka ba we thank you lord god we bless you in jesus his name the preceding program of the sports side by the good will prayers and financial resources of the Heritage Partners.